welcome to eCreator Solar's webinar on the new Part L building regulations in England. My name is Jess and today I'm your host, along with my colleague Alison. You'll hear from us again at the end of the webinar where we'll ask your questions to eCreator Solar. Today we'll be hearing from eCreator Solar CEO Paul Hutchins and Commercial Director Ryan Mee on what the challenges and implementation risks are surrounding Part L. If you do have any questions, please put them in the Q&A box and we'll try and answer as, as many as we can at the end. Any we don't manage to get to, we will personally try and answer in an email. Once the webinar is over, there will be a short survey at the end and we would really appreciate if you could give us some feedback. Now, it's time for me to pass you over to Paul. He will give you a short intro to we go to solar. Thanks, Jess, and good, good afternoon and welcome, everybody. I'm trying to work out why my uh, screen suddenly is not working. No, it is. That's absolutely fine. So good afternoon, everybody. My name is Paul Hutchins, as Jess said. I'm the founder and, and the uh, CEO of Eco2 Solar. Uh, today, we, we're on the third of three webinars. Um, the, the first two were more of an introductory thing, I guess, talking about Partel um, in terms of uh, what, what it means as, as regulation. Then talking a little bit more about the uh, the more technical aspects, and today we're going to talk about the implementation issues and implementation risks, and do a bit of a, a sort of a, a deeper dive into that element of it. Um, so I'm going to do a bit of an introduction initially uh, into Eco2 Solar and what is this part L thing, um, and then Ryan's going to pick up the the more sort of meaty bit around the implementation of it. So Eco2 Solar uh, specialise in uh, PV. Um, and other associated technologies uh, for new build. We specialise specifically in new build. Um, we do very little other than that. Um, and as a result of that, you know, we've acquired an expertise that allows us to, to work across the whole country, uh, working on new build developments, um, mostly relate, related to homes. So the things like the housing plots, for example, um, apartment blocks or, um, or maybe care homes. You may have seen, uh, it's a little bit old news now, but uh, in 2020, E.ON acquired a uh, just under 50% stake in us, which we're very pleased about. This obviously um, allows us to, to invest in the business and uh, move it forward in order to, to make certain we can take advantage of the, the huge opportunity for all of us, really, uh, to make uh, to make UK PLC building uh, much more uh, sustainable over the next few years. Um, as you'll see in the next slide, if I can get myself to it, um, the um, there we go. Uh, our reach is right across the whole of the UK. I think we're the only um, company can truly say that we cover all of the UK. We don't quite go from John O'Groats to Lands End, but we certainly go from Inverness down to down to Cornwall and across to Kent and anywhere in between. Operating out of our two hubs in uh, in Worcestershire and at East Kilbride. We work on a, around about a thousand plots a month um, and we're working on currently about 450 to, to 500 sites across the UK. We've been doing that for the last 15 years or so and we've completed over 25,000 installations now. Uh, our new ambition, and we haven't even set a date for this, this is hot off the press, is to become net zero. Um, so we've got a meeting, uh, a second meeting actually, to put the scoping together on that in the next couple of weeks. Um, I'm hoping that's going to be nearer to 2025 than it is to 2030, but we'll we'll see what comes out. Maybe we'll let you know. These are some of our clients. Um, as you'll see on the left hand side, those are our, uh, our preferred supplier or group deal clients. So those those we have uh, some kind of arrangement with them, like a preferred supplier agreement or service arrangement, uh, where we're able to supply to them across the whole of the UK. Um, and on the right hand side, these are clients that we also deal with significantly, but haven't necessarily got a formal arrangement in place to cover uh, all, all of England, all of the UK. So quite well known names there, you'll recognise, I'm sure. Uh, and we certainly deal with most of the, the major top 20 house builders. So just to give a little bit of context to what we're going to be talking about today and the whole issue of uh, Part L. Um, and, also, and about the uh, the future home standard that all fits within the framework of, of net zero. So net zero emissions by 2050 have been pledged by the UK government in law and everything, not just uh, construction of buildings, um, but also heating and transport and so on are all leading towards this net zero by 2050. And there's a number of milestones within that, not least of which the building is efficient to halve energy uh, use in new buildings by 2030, uh, reduce them by 78% by 2035, um, putting in place um, zero carbon 
probably zero, zero fossil fuel emissions vehicles by 2030 and the future home standard in 2025 where all new built homes will have low carbon heating and very high levels of energy efficiency. And leading off that is this new part L and SAP, uh, which is a st stepping stone towards that future home standard. So, so there was a consultation a few years ago, you will remember, I guess, um, around two options relating to part L. Um, the government chose uh, option two, which was the more progressive of the two, which is a 31% improvement um, on part L 2013. And the expectation is that future building services improve window new uh, roof view values uh, and with some technology like PV or heat pumps will be used to, to meet that standard. In 2025, shortly after that, really, in, in, in regulatory terms, the future home standard comes into place. And that's likely to reduce uh, energy use um, and give an improvement of 70 to 80 percent over Part L 2013. And there's a phase out fossil fuels in homes completely, which is obviously quite ambitious and is likely to result in, in more technologies being used, for example, low carbon heating, such as heat pumps uh, or maybe LEDs alongside uh, PV and other technologies. So what is the effect of Part L in 2022? This comes into effect, theoretically at least, um, from June the 15th of this year. Um, and the difference it'll make uh, overall really is, is that currently in England anyway, um, all, all of the renewable energy going into new builds is based on the planning and energy at powers. For example, Bristol has 20%, London's is 35%, um, and others have nothing at all. So you may find that certain areas, certain towns, certain cities, even certain uh, sides of streets um, will we'll have a target and others won't. So it becomes very pepper potted in terms of where you see things like solar, for example. And the, the part L where option two will mean that this stuff will become a lot more uh, ubiquitous. Um, and things like, for example, wastewater heat recovery, solar PV, uh, fabric improvements will become uh, much more common um, throughout all of the builds across the whole of England and Wales and, and separately Scotland. So the timescales are um, the legislation was laid down in December last year. Uh, for the new Part L, Part F, and the, over, the new overheating regulations. Um, in June 22 to 15th of June, to be exact, the new part, new regulations come into, into effect. But there is a 12-month transition period, which I'll talk about in the next slide. Um, and then in 2025, which is only a short period after that, really, the full future home standard comes into force. So the, the timing on this really is that in June 2022, theoretically all homes come under the new regulations. But if you lodge uh, planning and building regs um, for a particular plot, and then you, you gain a 12 month transitional arrangement to, to work that on that plot under the 2013 regulations. So it's on a plot by plot basis. You can't lodge a site, you can only plot, you only lodge individual plots. And any, any plots that get acceptance, uh, must, you must start work on that plot before June, 2023. And STAR is quite specific. It means that you have to have started excavating or digging out the foundation of the plot, not of the site, piling or boring of the plot and drainage work specific, all drainage work specific to the plot. Bear in mind the Planning and Energy Act powers remain unamended, so local authorities can still define higher standards than the building regulations. And as I said, in 2025, uh, the fuel, full future home standard comes in with a, a ban on gas boilers, oil boilers and the like. Now, it's a pretty sharp process that they're expecting, and they confirmed this last week, to consult on the future home standard in 2023, which is really when the future of Hartel will come into uh, full, full uh, implementation. They're legislating 2024, implementing 2025, probably with a 12-month transition period, which means in practice it all comes into, into play in 2026. <coughs> Finally, um, from me, an example of how this might work. Now, people, developers will approach this in different ways, but talking to the major house builders and, and consultants like AES who put together this, uh, this particular slide, um, the majority, not the vast majority, but the majority will go for probably a gas plus PV option on most properties. So in this particular instance, this is a slightly smaller than average home. It's a two-story, three beds, end or semi, uh, and end terrace or semi, about 80 square meters. Um, and that would, would, would meet the conditions by some fabric improvements, a gas combi boiler, um, a wastewater heat recovery, uh, and, and about two kilowatts of PV panels. Now, it may well be that much larger plots uh, might need a heat pump instead of as, or as well, but that currently is, is likely to be the case that most will opt for this, uh, this gas plus PV plus probably wastewater heat recovery option. 
Okay, uh, that's it from me. I'll pass over to Ryan. He'll take you through the more detailed implementation. Thank you. Welcome everybody uh, to the third webinar that we're running. So as Paul said, this is all about implementation. Um, we covered uh, specifically around the technology and part of in, in greater detail in the other two webinars that we run. So we will be sending you out the links to those at the end of this webinar so that you can catch up on those. So I'm here to talk specifically about implementation, what it means and you know, what might go right and might, what might go wrong. So just to recap uh, what we've previously discussed, talking to a lot of developers over the last few months, um, everybody seems to be in agreement that the vast majority are going to approach this with solar PV, wastewater heat recovery and um, some tweaks to the fabric. An average system size uh, seems to be around two to two and a half kilowatts, so around seven or eight PV panels on the roof. So larger house types need larger systems, smaller or smaller, so it's based on the footprint. Um, we're still waiting, or you guys are waiting for you know, the final version of SAP, which they helpfully said would be sometime before June, but the HPF believes that that's likely to be April or May, so hopefully that comes out um, so that everybody knows what they're actually going to be working to. Some additional stuff around photo evidence that's going to be required uh, for as-built comparisons to designs, and we've already got some solutions for that that we've implemented a couple of years ago. And really, the, the challenge from our perspective is this uh, inevitable, rather than potential, um, upwards cliff. So I've shown this to a lot of customers over the last six months, and nobody seems to be uh, disagreeing with me, and it's quite a scary uh, climb that we can see from a supply chain perspective. Uh, but just to recap what we covered previously, roughly 10% of houses in England have solar installed uh, due to the planning conditions in certain areas. Um, if 80% of developers move towards PV and gas as their part L solution, we're in for a significant increase. So you know, going from 18,000 houses in England having PV to 144,000 houses having PV, you know, times eight in a very short period of time is, is a huge challenge. So even if we've got those numbers slightly wrong, it may be 75% or 72%, whatever it turns out to be, you know, it is still big numbers that are involved. So we can't underestimate the challenges ahead. More significantly, it's a, such a short period of time that we go from the 10% to you know, quickly 30% and then 80% literally in the space of uh, a few months because of the way that volume developers seem to be approaching this where they'll build out as many plots or start as many plots as they possibly can. Um, it doesn't give us that you know, potential to slowly, gradually scale up. Um, but to put it in context, when this, this all kicks in and if 80% of houses have solar, the first quarter of 2024 for the first three months, double the amount of solar for the whole of 2021 will be required. So asking a supply chain to, to meet those requirements, um, you know, there's gonna be some challenges and a lot of people that are gonna feel a significant amount of pain. So here's some steps that, um, you know, there are other things more detailed around this to get this right, but these are the simple measures that we're, we're advocating that people follow. And certainly this is the approach that we're taking with people that have shown commitment to us and signed group trading agreements. So on the left is how we're approaching it. On the right is how others may approach it and you know the, the consequences and the pain that's going to come from getting it wrong. But essentially, if we if we look to get it right, you want to secure your PV installer, a specialist PV installer, as early as is physically possible because you need to show some commitment to them um, so that they can start to work on the designs of the houses, identify any challenges that the houses may have around the space, obstacles, uh, things might not fit on the roof. Um, if you do that very early on, it gives you the opportunity to come up with solutions for that. We talked a lot in the previous uh, presentations around the DNO. So those of you that weren't aware, the DNO is the district network operator. It used to be called the grid before it was sold off. Um, the grid is the single biggest constraint that I can see to meeting these obligations. Because if we take um, a PV installer that's able to try and, you know, 
make sure that they've got stock, make sure that they've done the designs, make sure that they've got labor and resource to meet these challenges. That's relatively in our control. The one thing that we don't control and you don't control is the grid. Now the grid has to give you permission to collect any solar PV system uh, before you're allowed to connect it and commission it. So it's an easy process, but it's a challenging um, scenario for new build installations. So to get it right takes a lot of proactive planning and they will have the ultimate say on whether you're allowed to connect or not. And I've got an example of the challenges that we're already encountering. So once we've started to factor in the designs around the grid constrictions, um, we would then issue a standard trade specification that's very detailed around, you know, which houses are having what quantity of solar, how it looks, how it integrates with the roofing contractor, how it integrates with the electrical contractor, the cables that are required from them. So everybody knows on every house, this is what you need to do to get it right. We are then starting to work with divisions and regions to build in the plot forecast. So, you know, we can take some assumptions of seven or eight panels on X number of plots per region per year. At least then we can start to uh, procure stock early. We can buy stock in advance so that when this really starts to bite and, and everything's in short supply, we're trying to mitigate you know, the impact that that brings. We can then scale up to meet those targets. So we know based on us installing a thousand plots a month currently to seven or eight thousand plots a month when this really hits. You know, we know how many teams we need and we know how we need to set them up to quickly scale up and meet the requirements. We then work with you and the DNO as a partner to, to try and make it as smooth as possible to get connection. And we're no longer a supplier and a customer. We're a partnership to try and overcome those hurdles, which will be significant um, and work collaboratively in partnership. If you take the other approach, um, which many people will probably do and leave it relatively late on in the process, because you know, people may think that this is 18 months away when the plots come into question. So people will be going out to tender site by site, you know, anywhere from an electrical contractor to a roofing contractor to a few PD specialists. There's no commitment, it's you know, going after the cheapest price. That will lead to a generic pay, uh, vague PV specification. Nobody will have done the uh, detailed designs that you need to do. So you may come up against some challenges quite late on into the build program. Inevitably, there's going to be a lack of supply, a shortage of labor because of the volume involved. There'll be non-specialist companies installing equipment, maybe non-compliant installations as a result. Uh, the DNO will start to push back because of the connection challenges that we'll have encounter and you won't get to know about that until very late on into the build program. So part of the CML process and the handover to the homeowner, you need an MCS certificate, which is generated uh, when we commission the system. Any delay to that, so if you can't get the panels or the inverter or the resource or the grid approval, will lead in uh, to um, a failure of CML. Uh, delays in handover, potential compensation claims, you know, uh, increased number of defects on the roof because of the lack of control uh, and potentially people having then to switch to other technologies such as air source heat pumps partway through a site because they can no longer get PV systems that they need um, to get the houses connected and compliant. So we've mapped out a, a timeline process for you. So we've put 12 months, you know, we're already working on this stuff 18 months in advance with group deal customers, but 12 months has been set up because in 12 months time, double the amount of solar will be required as, that is currently being installed when the transitional period starts to come to a close. So to start from the beginning, you know, tying down your specialist installer under watertight trading agreement to basically give them a commitment to use their expertise to carry out all of the detailed designs, identify the challenges, whether that be space on the roof or constraints from the grid. Uh, we would then work with you to do the forecasts on the sites. The challenge that you've got also is on new developments to start on these regulations are quite straightforward to know, you know that site now has PV on every roof, but you've got the added complexity of existing plots that you started before on old regulations. Some of those will fall into these new regs. So it's gonna need some, somebody that knows what they're doing that can act very quickly to help you overcome those specific challenges. We would then look to forward buy uh, stock and do the planning. So, you know, we buy direct from manufacturers. 
Um, it comes from the Far East, can take, you know, three months to six months, not accounting for somebody trying to do a three-point turn in the Suez Canal. Um, but, you know, we're trying our best to make sure that we've got the stock to meet the requirements for the houses that we're contracted for, for our group deal customers. We would then set up a very clear and easy process with training for all the sites to establish a call-off process. They know exactly what they need to do. They know who they need to contact and when. Um, and then we do the DNO application for you per site. So you may think that we can make this easy, the DNO thing that we keep talking to you and scaring you about. And you know, let's just put in our application for all of the sites that we're planning to do for the next three or four years. Unfortunately, it's not that easy and it's more of a challenge because we cannot apply for you until you have the MPANs for the development. And as you know, the MPANs only come quite late on, uh, very close to uh, starting the very first plot on that site. So we can't apply until quite late on to that site has been started and they can take at the moment two months to process the application and to tell you whether it's um, you can connect or if there's any restrictions. So if you imagine the volume that's going to hit the DNO operators with everybody applying for lots and lots of houses and lots of sites, that two months is going to go out to you know, potentially double, potentially triple. So having somebody like us as an installer, we employ three people just to deal with the DNO applications and chase and harass DNO um, operators on a daily basis. So once we've overcome that hurdle, although there's lots of work um, needed to go into that to make it as smooth as we can, from then on, for us, it's relatively business as usual. So we carry out the installation of the panels on the roof. Two to three months later, when the house is nearing completion, we come back and commission the system. Within about 48 hours of uh, commissioning the system, everybody gets their handover pack and the critical MCS certificate, which you then need for CML and ultimately, you know, happy days. Now the timeline is more condensed on this one. This isn't a 12 month, uh, timeline because this assumes that people leave it a lot later than this to give them a good chance of having a smooth transition so people will be going out to you know potentially every man and his dog tendering on a site by site basis there's no specific pv specification to work to no upfront designs have been done so people are not aware of problems until quite late on in the process installers or non-specialists are winning jobs piecemeal so they win one they might lose the next few so there's no commitment from them to go and buy panels to make sure they've got stock for when the site starts. The other thing to mention is that, you know, as we're with the largest solar installer, specifically around new build in the UK, and we, we buy a greater volume than most people, if people are buying on a piecemeal project basis, there's a greater chance of starting with one system and then having to switch to others uh, and the constraint that that will put on their cash flow to having to forward buy stock. Uh, that will lead to increased costs, uh, which everybody's feeling the pain at the moment, you know, across the board. But a lack of availability will lead to everybody just installing whatever they can get their hands on, basically. So you may have in-roof systems then having to revert to on-roof systems, low quality control, a result of that. Finding out the inverters don't fit where they wanted them to uh, because the designs weren't done. These two extra costs with people lead, chasing out cables, redecorating. And then everything that comes as a result of low quality control and high volume in a short period of time from you know, leaking roofs, defects, um, fire risks, delays from the DNO, or as a result of stock not being available, ultimately leading in a failure to complete on that deadline and not meeting the handover, uh, which is always bad and leads to unhappy customers from a developer's perspective and a homeowner's perspective. So the second stage of what we're already doing for a lot of customers is going into detail on the designs of the house types. So it starts with your SAP assessors. We know that you can't, we can't rely on the current SAP because it's not been approved yet, but it gives us a good starting point. But the SAP assessors will tell us um, essentially per house type what the kilowatt peak target is. So we would need to look at those and say, you know, does it all fit on the roof? Are there any obstacles? And prime examples of those challenges is something like this, where there's a room in the roof, there's Velux windows, there's dormers, gables, whatever it may be, uh, and we need to find a solution. Doing those designs 12 months in advance allows us to come up with a solution um, rather than you know, dealing with it on a site-wide basis when we've already started work and then you know, everything gets very stressful. 
So room in the roof, there's no loft space um, and other you know, cottage flats and stuff like this that's going to cause a bit of a challenge. Um, if we're not putting the inverter in the loft space, then we need to find somewhere else for it to go. So we may identify certain houses that the inverter has to go in the use space if there's one under the stairs in a utility room, wherever, wherever that may be. Now that has impact on uh, regulations and costs. Because if we're taking it from the loft space and we're putting it downstairs, then there's a different sequence that needs to be done. So uh, we need protective uh, capping on the DC cable or steel wide armored cable to be run from the loft and then isolated down to the new inverter location, because you, you can't run DC cable unprotected through walls for this, the risk of people drilling through them, putting, putting pictures up, etc. cetera. Um, but that then causes a further challenge because the manufacturers have certain clearances on them. You need to allow ventilation to occur around the inverter. Um, so if you put that in a confined space, then you run the risk of the manufacturers not um, warranting that product. And furthermore, you know, everybody's uh, broom covers are just full of coats and clothes and whatever it may be. Um, so that space that should be kept clear for ventilation may no longer be kept clear when people move into the properties. And anywhere where you now have an electrical piece of equipment that um, gives you some information that was up in the loft that is now under a stairs, uh, you run the risk of people playing with it and tampering with it. So the handover process and the education of the homeowners becomes even more important working with a specialist on those particular house types. One of the other challenges that we need to overcome when we're looking at the house types is again the grid. So some of the larger house types that we're working on for customers, you know, some of these systems that need to be installed for compliance, are, you know, five, six, seven and a half kilowatt PV systems because they're big houses. Now the grid doesn't like you to install anything over four kilowatts on a single phase supply. So there's two solutions really, either a three phase supply needs to be running, which is extremely expensive and prohibitive. Um, so although we may have space on the roof, like you can see there to, ex to hit that target of six and a half kilowatts, the grid are telling us that we really need to cap it at four kilowatts. So it doesn't mean that they won't allow connection, but it means that you're not going to find out about whether it's allowed or not until potentially two months before you start work on that development, which is running the risk of you know, leaving it late and extra costs. One solution that's currently available is to install export limiters, which means that an extra cable has to be run up to the inverter. And then if the grid says that it has to be restricted, any time where it's exceeding that output back to the grid of four kilowatts, essentially it shuts the system down and trips out and stops it from producing the power if the homeowner isn't using that energy and it's exporting back to the uh, grid. So. On that basis, we run the risk of unhappy homeowners because they're not getting the export payments that that energy would have provided for them. Um, and the system potentially is tripping out any time that it starts to meet its full potential if it exceeds four kilowatts. So again, the devil is in the detail and we need to be educating people and identifying these particular challenges very early on. So I've just shown you a, a case study of a challenge that we've recently overcome in Glasgow for a developer. So in 2015, the, the Scottish building regs changed um, and over the last five or six years, roughly 80% of new world houses in Scotland have had um, around one and a half kilowatts of PV installed on them. So quite quickly with this volume of PV going on at scale on every other, every house essentially, uh, the DNO started to see that there were some hotspots where infrastructure wasn't designed to cope with the potential export of that power, you know, systems feeding back to the grid rather than consuming it on site. So this particular challenge that we've very recently overcome, uh, Scottish Power was the DNO for the site. There was a 100 kVA limit per substation, so 300 kVA is allowable on this particular development. But with the amount of PV that needed to be installed on this development, uh, we were left with 12 plots that were over that limit. And essentially they said that you can't install them, you can't connect to our grid. So normally we would approach this and say, okay, we'll put in export limiters to, to, on those 12 plots to overcome that challenge. Um, but in this particular area, the fault level issues meant that that wasn't a solution that SPEN were allowing. They said that there was no planned upgrades for the area. So 
we were left and the developer was left with 12 houses out of that development right at the end that there was no solution for and you couldn't install PV to get connection. So the result and how we overcome it was basically 12 months of harassing and chasing and trying to get meetings with the developer, ourselves as the middleman, uh, Scottish Power, and then SSE with the IDNO on the site. And 12 months later, after being made aware of that problem when we did the application on the very first houses, um, they allowed 30 kilowatts of extra capacity to be allocated to those 12 houses, which meant that they could get connected. So the reason why I'm showing you this is because England and the adoption rates and the scale is, you know, maybe seven times, eight times more than in Scotland is very quickly going to become a problem as we've seen in Scotland. We've got you know, history of this happening in Scotland. Even with a specialist like us doing this and proactively chasing them all the time and trying to get an answer, it still took 12 months from getting a red warning flag around connection to coming up with a solution. So it's going to become a problem for a lot of English developments. And it highlights the fact why, you know, a roofing contractor, electrical contractor, somebody that doesn't know what they're doing, aren't going to be able to come up with this solution for you. And uh, it's going to lead to a significant amount of pain. As a result of the volume that we started to do in Scotland very quickly, we were, we were very quickly up to about 150 new build sites in Scotland within about an 18 month period of, of the, the new regulations kicking in. Doing over a thousand houses across the country uh, per month uh, really tests your quality control. It's impossible to go around auditing and you know, surveying this on the ground. So we implemented a number of years ago uh, what we call a right first time approach. So every time that our guys turn up to a, an installation, they have tablets telling them where they've got to go, what the job is, how many panels they need to install. They have to follow a very strict process around signing in on site, have the RAMs been approved, take photos of the installation from start to finish to prove how the roof was before we started, how it was when we left it. That then gets picked up by an in-house team that audits 100% of our installations. So we still spot check installations on the grounds, but 100% of them are, are visually inspected by our in-house team. So here's a snapshot of our, our live dashboard that we've got visibility of um, you know, live every day to see how we're performing. And in March, we did 1,482 installations and right first time passes of 99.33%. So very tiny amount of non-conformances. And when you drill into the non-conformances, we have different ratings um, and those would be very minor, important, very minor non-conformances. It could be something like, you know, a label hasn't been put on the right part of a meter or something you know, trivial, but very important. It gets picked up by our in-house team and then it gets addressed and the installer has to go back and rectify it. And it maintains that high quality. We've been running at that 99%, 98% level for the last 18 months or so when, since it was adopted. And if you don't have something like that in place, when the scale starts to hit and the lack of control starts to really hit, then you know the quality is going to suffer. So we've already got this in place to keep control of that. And the more installations that we do, every one of them will be um, audited. And it means that we also have the... Um, photo evidence that you now are going to need to prove what was installed on the roof. Already have that now for the last couple of years. So some of the risks that will be posed by poor implementation, lack of control um, and lack of planning with enough time. People installing whatever they can get their hands on, non-specialists installing, you know, um, potentially cheaper systems uh, that aren't fit for purpose, or it may be one where, you know, the installation hasn't been coordinated with a roofing contractor. So there's a couple of installations of flashing that hasn't been dressed down by the roofers because it wasn't stuck down because different flashings need different um, methods of dressing them down by the roofing contractor. So that will lead to a lot of defects, potential leaking roofs on site. Um, fire is an obvious risk because it is a electrical uh, system that's been installed on the roof. Uh, this wasn't one of our fires. This was um, one that was in the Daily Mail 2017 by Wharf Fire in London. I'm not trying to alarm anybody. Um, this is a slide that we've um, borrowed from uh, Viridian, one of our suppliers. 
um, which highlights a report that the BRE did on fires that they believed were attributed to solar PV between 2015 and 2018, around 33 fires that they believed were caused by the solar systems. Um, when you extrapolate that and you compare it fires per year per million appliances, you can see there the UK at 14 is half the amount of an appliance like a dishwasher or you know, everything else that's a, a gen general appliance that, that's in pretty much every household. So it's a very, very low risk, I'm not trying to alarm you. Um, and the reason why the Netherlands is you know, double the amount of the UK is because there's no MCS standard, there's no regulations that currently that the Netherlands have to work to. So we're already in a good position by having the MCS standards that have to be followed. But it doesn't mean that you know when non-specialists get involved, roofing contractors making electrical connections on the roof, you know, it, it increases that risk. Of the report that the BRE did on those uh, fires, um, they tried to work out which were the main causes. And the clear, um, the clear causes uh, between what they felt caused those fires, 43% of them they believe were down to the DC isolator. So that's where the panels, the cable comes into the loft. That's the point of isolation in the loft space. That could have been arcing as a result of a poor connection made by the cable into the isolator, or it could have been uh, poor quality, something that wasn't rated highly enough to cope with the, the volts or the amps that are coming through the isolator. And then the next biggest one was the physical connectors on the roof. So when you look at the connectors on the roof and the isolator in the loft, those are two things that can't, the, the one on the roof can't be done you know, in a factory, in a warehouse, in a controlled environment. That's done sometimes in poor conditions, in rain or sleet or snow, by guys that are trying to crimp cables and make that connection on, on the cable that comes from the last panel down into the loft space. We've taken measures um, as a company for a number of years now to, to do the everything else as much as we can in a controlled environment. So our DC connectors and our inverters and everything else from there on is done in a warehouse so we can do it in a controlled, safe environment so it minimizes that risk. But again, it's a very low risk, but it's increased by using a non-specialist. Wind is the other factor. So we went into detail on the other webinars about the different type of systems out there. Most people are installing in roof systems because the cost is you know, comparable and there's, there's lower risk from rodent damage and um, you know, visually they look a lot better. But with different systems, <coughs> which I won't go into detail on, but require different modification to the roof. So a, a system with a plastic tray that needs extra battens installed um, and sometimes can't be installed in certain areas of the UK because of the wind force. If you're relying on an installer or a non-specialist knowing about every single detail that goes into those systems, um, the pictures towards the right hand side was a, a system that we were called to go and inspect for a developer that we didn't do. And essentially the installer hadn't fixed the clamps that you can see on the right hand side circled in blue and put the final clamps on the end of the system. So it was a PV specialist company, but they missed off three clamps out of you know, 50 or so, and that literally got ripped off the roof uh, and landed in a garden. So again, it's, it's a big risk that's posed by higher volume, lower quality control, and um, you know, non-specialists taking out installations. So this is um, the last slide, really. This is the closing slide. So we, we talked in the last webinar about, you know, we would love to do a gradual imp implementation on the below numbers so that everybody starts working to the new standards um, quicker rather than pushing them back to the end. But we appreciate that, you know, the vast majority of the industry is still going to try to mitigate the, um, the cost implications of this and build as many houses as they can to the old regulations and then really give us this steep cliff to overcome. So this is really to say to you, you know, this is a very severe challenge. And what I've just discussed in the previous slides, following that process, tying down installers, showing commitment to a specialist just gives you the best chance of success and minimizes the pain that you'll feel um, if you don't follow those processes. And that's it from me. Thank you. I'm going to hand back to Jess and uh, we've got a Q&A session to go through. Thank you.
Thank you, um, Paul and Ryan. That was really, really uh, good and really insightful. Um, so now we'll just go to a couple of questions. Um, and if anyone else has any more questions for um, today, please put them into the Q&A uh, section in the webinar. Uh, so if we'll start with Alison, I believe you've got a question mm -hmm. already. Yep, so we've got one here. Um, if you had a battery system, rather than the system tripping out at four kilowatts and not reaching the system's full potential, could you feed that excess energy to be stored into a battery for later use? Sure, yeah, I can pick that one up, yeah. So yes, you can. Obviously, any surplus energy um, from a solar PV system can be fed into a battery. If we're talking about this to mitigate the um, restrictions from the grid, we would have to um, satisfy the grid that, you know, imagine that the battery is full and the system is still generating. Is that is there a potential that that could still happen? So it's not an easy solution um, to propose that. On top of that, you obviously have the increased cost of the battery system, which might be the same price as the solar PV system in the first place. So the answer really is yes, it could be, but there's um, a lot of work that needs to be done on each individual house type and engaging with a specialist to talk to the grid to see you know, what's the solution on particular house types that have those challenges. Okay, amazing. We've got one other one, which is, um, is how much space does it take up on the roof? Um, yeah, so each, PV panel is roughly about 1.6, 1.7 square meters. So depending on how much space, uh, how much, how many kilowatts uh, you need, you can extrapolate that backwards as a per square meter um, for an output. So let, let's say a panel output is 340 watts. You need three of those panels to um, get to one kilowatts there or thereabouts. And that's roughly six square meters. Um, but it doesn't mean that if you've got a 20 square meter roof and 18 square meters of PV, until you look at the obstacles on the roof, you obviously don't know whether it's going to clash or it's going to fit how you need them to fit. But it's a good um, rule of thumb. Fab, uh, I think we've got another one. Um, so why is the cliff so steep? <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll pick that one up. Um, it's, it's because of the way the, uh, the regulation has been put together, because it allows... Um, for builders to lodge um, lodge their applications for building regulations and planning by June the 15th uh, for plots so they could, you could do a list of plots for example then on the um, on the on the 15th of June 2023 you could start some of those plots but then when you're going to get to a point let's say by I don't know August September 2023 where people are run out of things to lodge applications for and get started and they're all suddenly start so effectively the more people push these back the steeper the cliff's going to be. Uh, obviously, not everybody's going to have the um, uh, the luxury of being able to do that. Um, and maybe they will choose strategically or otherwise not to do that. But if everybody pushed it right to the wire, everything would suddenly start increasing from about August, September 2023. So that's why it's so steep. And that's why we're encouraging uh, companies and builders to make certain that, A, they plan uh, in advance of this to get people on board to, to help them with it from a supply chain perspective get materials lined up designs done applied to the DNA all that's good stuff that, that Ryan was talking about but also you know we're possible to try and soften that cliff by by phasing things slightly and, and not pushing it all to the wire. Thank you uh, we've got another one as well um, if any are there any maintenance to the panels? No, the, 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 the panels don't require any maintenance per se. Um, they are, you know, they're electrical solid state piece of kit. So, you know, if you put them on the roof, um, they will continue to work like an electrical circuit. Um, that doesn't mean nothing can ever go wrong. So you need to keep an eye on things in the same way as you would with everything else to make sure it's working properly. But it doesn't require any kind of, you know, annual maintenance check or whatever. Now, there is the arguments around whether solar panels need cleaning or not. Um, and the, the answer to that actually is that if they're on a pitch of more than about five or 10 degrees, which most are, 
um, then uh, they should be uh, relatively self-cleaning. So in other words, the, you know, the rain will wash off any, any sort of dust or anything that happens. Obviously, from, from the perspective of a, um, a, a, a very dirty area, for example, if you're seaside, maybe with lots of seagulls, you know what seagulls do, apart from stilly chips. Um, but also, if you know, see an extremely dusty area, for example, you might find that there's, um, you know, there's, a, there's a lot of dust that makes it worth cleaning. Obviously, it's, it's worth, you have to do that properly. Um, it's best probably not just just to get a hose pipe and and, and aim it at the solar panels because it is you know particularly in, in the middle of the day when the sun's shining it is um, you know a, a live um, DC uh, current going on, but uh, it, it's also the case that, that you know if you're going to get things cleaned, um, it probably is only really worth it for larger installs. So so if you've got I don't know a solar farm that's got you know ten thousand solar panels on it, it's probably worth getting somebody to come and clean it once a year. And it would give you an extra one percent or two percent or something, but on a, a smaller home array, it's probably not not cost effective. Put it that way to do that. So generally speaking, they don't need cleaning or maintenance, but it doesn't mean you can't. Thank you. Great, thanks, Paul. Uh, we've got another question. So the inverters have a life expectancy. What is it, please? <laughs> yeah, generally they they have between um, typically a five year guarantee from the manufacturers. So. Um, between five to 10 years is the life expectancy, <clears throat> depending on where you put them. If you're putting them somewhere, you know, like I was saying, under a cupboard, which doesn't have the, the space ventilation that they need, then that will probably shorten because they will get hotter than they, they're designed to do. Um, but yeah, the, the inverters generally have a very, very low failure rate. And we're talking, you know, like under 1% of global inverters that fail within that five year period. So once they're installed, it's um, between five and 10 years. And you, and you know if they're not working because it's not a gradual decline. It either works or it doesn't typically. So somebody would notice that it stopped doing what it should be doing and their system isn't working. And um, obviously that would then be raised as a, a defect um, under warranty and sorted out. Okay. Uh, we've got another one here. Um, how much more efficient are yours over competitors? <laughs> <laughs> Generally, they're all pretty much the same. So um, you can you can install you know, a 450 watt PV panel, which is more efficient, but takes up you know, quite a lot more space and is a lot more expensive. So it doesn't mean that somebody has access to a more efficient panel than somebody else. The trick and the, the, the process we follow is to say, what, what do we need to achieve in terms of a target on the roof? What space is there? and then work backwards to find the most cost-effective solution. So if we've got lots of space, we don't need to go out and buy the most efficient panel that money can buy that's more expensive um, than you know, a good quality Ford Mondeo equivalent PV system, as long as it's compliant and um, you know, we, we've done the due diligence on the system. Um, so yeah, you, you can, we can buy any panel that's manufactured in the world. It's just a case of what's the most relevant, what's more fit for purpose per developer. Alison, I think we've got one more. Uh, um, so we've just had another one. How does the introduction of a microgrid solution on a project affect what you guys do where the benefit of an electricity produce of an electri electricity produced through the panels is owned by the microgrid as opposed to a conventional DNO route? I, I, I'll pick that up. Um, it it kind of depends on, on how that's set up. There's a number of permutations of how you could do that. But um, I mean, it, in, in, in essence, it would work the same way as it normally would in the sense that uh, the PV panels will be connected to an electricity supply um, with, within the building or the home um, generally. And, and as a result of that, that's if, if, there's, if there's load in the home or in the building, uh, when there's this PV generation happening and energy being produced, it will be uh, used within that home. If it's not, it then flows out into the grid and it'll be used wherever, it can, wherever else it can find a sort of dip in voltage, i.e. some kind of load or need. Um, a, a microgrid really is more of a, in a sense, is more of a commercial thing from this perspective, in a sense that the PV will either be used, say if you've got a battery in, by the way, either in front of or behind the meter, it will absorb any excess before it goes anywhere else as well. But generally speaking, well, any PV energy it's produced will be looking for a load either in the home or further out into the grid. Now, in terms of um, you know any further implications, it depends on how the microgrid is set up, um, both commercially and technically, in terms of exactly what it would do. Thanks, Paul. Um, we've got another one as well. Uh, do your panels have the full backing to maximise the energy that's being taken in? 
Um, most of them, well, in terms of efficiency, there are you know different panels out there. Some power, for example, is the most the world's most efficient panel. Um, that has different technology to increase the absorption rates of the PV panel. But in terms of what we install for customers, it, it's it's a different driver to uh, potentially a homeowner that wants to put them in to maximise the efficiency of the system and you know generate the most power that they possibly can. Because we're, we're basically installing a kilowatt peak system on a roof that needs to hit a certain benchmark. So you find that the higher efficiency uh, panels like SunPower um, won't be installed on a new build development because what, what they're trying to achieve is to meet a standard. You know, if it's a two kilowatt system and we install a two kilowatt system, as long as the system is good quality, um, then that's the driver for new build housing. Thank you, Bob. Uh, I think we've got another one. Uh, where do you resource the solar panels from? They, the most um, PV cells, which is the building blocks, if you like, of, uh, of solar, um, tend to come from the Far East, mostly China. Um, some are built outside of China in other places like the Philippines and Turkey and Brazil and so on. Um, and then there's, there's sometimes a, a, a fairly elaborate supply chain of where these things go. There's the, the, the frames, for example, and the building of the cells into solar panels might happen somewhere else. They might happen in Europe. They might happen in the Far East or they might happen somewhere in between. Um, but uh, the, the vast majority of the building blocks are made in China or the Far East in the same way as, as a similar technology to uh, the chips you find in your computer or your phone. Again, they're made in you know very large, um, cost-effective facilities in the Far East currently, mostly. Um, that, of course, might change what's happening in the world with coronaviruses and wars and political change and people wanting to you know reshore things. So, um, you know, watch this space. Amazing. Um, any other questions that we've got coming in? We will uh, make sure we answer um, following on from this webinar. There is a survey as well as soon as you leave the webinar. So if you could give us feedback, that would be amazing. But for now, thank you so much, Paul. And thank you so much, Ron. And we hope to uh, speak to everyone soon. Thank you. Thank you all. Thanks, Jess. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, Bye. Thank you. Bye.